Hello, my beloved followers. I am Jesus, and I am here to share with you the remarkable journey of my life on earth. It all began when my cousin, John the Baptist, was preaching in the wilderness, calling people to repentance and baptizing them in the Jordan River. John was a voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way for my arrival. One day, as John saw me approaching, he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John knew his mission was to point people towards me, the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. I approached John, asking to be baptized. John hesitated, saying he was not worthy, but I insisted. As I came up from the water, the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove, resting upon me. A voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This moment marked the beginning of my public ministry. First Miracles and Disciples After my baptism, I began to gather my first disciples. These were ordinary men who would soon become extraordinary messengers of my teachings. The first two disciples I called were Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were simple fishermen, casting their nets into the Sea of Galilee. When I saw them, I said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Without hesitation, they left their nets, their boats, and their livelihood behind to follow me. Their immediate response showed their faith and readiness to embark on a new journey. As we traveled together, we attended a wedding in Cana. It was a joyful occasion, but during the celebration, a significant problem arose, the host had run out of wine. This could have caused great embarrassment and disappointment. My mother, Mary, aware of the situation, came to me and simply said, they have no more wine. She believed in my ability to help, even though I had not performed any miracles yet. Trusting her faith, I decided to intervene. I instructed the servants to fill six large stone jars with water, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Once the jars were filled to the brim, I told them to draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. When the master tasted the water that had been turned into wine, he was astonished. He called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This first miracle not only resolved the immediate crisis but also revealed my glory to those present. My disciples, witnessing this miracle, believed in me even more deeply. As we continued our journey, I performed many more miracles, each demonstrating my authority over sickness, evil spirits, and nature itself. I healed the sick, including those with leprosy, paralysis, and other severe ailments. I cast out demons from those who were tormented, freeing them from their suffering. One day, as we crossed the Sea of Galilee, a fierce storm arose. The waves crashed over the boat, and my disciples were terrified. They woke me, pleading for help, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. I got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and said, Quiet. Be still. Immediately, the wind died down, and the sea became completely calm. My disciples were amazed and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. These acts of power and compassion showed the people that the kingdom of God had come near. Through my miracles, I demonstrated not only my divine authority but also my deep love and care for humanity. Each miracle was a sign pointing to a greater reality, inviting people to believe in me and to experience the transformative power of God's kingdom. Teachings and Parables One of the most memorable events in my ministry was the feeding of the 5,000. A large crowd had followed me to a remote place eager to hear my teachings and witness the miracles I performed. As the day wore on, the people became hungry, and it was clear that there was no food available for such a large gathering. My disciple Philip was concerned and wondered aloud where we could possibly buy enough bread to feed everyone. He knew it would be an impossible task to find enough food in such a desolate place. I looked at the crowd with compassion and decided to teach my disciples and the people a powerful lesson about faith and provision. I asked the crowd to sit down on the grassy hillside, organizing them into groups. Then, I took the five small barley loaves and two fish that a young boy had generously offered. Holding the food in my hands, I gave thanks to God for his provision. After giving thanks, I began to break the loaves and fish into pieces, handing them to my disciples to distribute among the people. Miraculously, as we continued to distribute the food, it multiplied. Everyone in the crowd ate until they were completely satisfied. It was incredible to see thousands of men, women, and children enjoying the meal. When everyone had eaten their fill, we gathered the leftovers and filled twelve baskets with the remaining pieces. This abundance showed that God's provision is more than enough for all our needs. This miracle was not just about feeding people physically, it carried a deeper spiritual truth. I used this moment to teach the crowd that I am the bread of life. I explained to them that those who come to me will never hunger, and those who believe in me will never thirst. I challenged them to look beyond their physical needs and understand that eternal life comes through faith in me, not just through physical sustenance. I wanted them to see that just as physical bread sustains the body, I sustain the soul. To further illustrate the truths of the kingdom of God, I often spoke in parables, simple stories with profound meanings. One such parable was about a sower who went out to sow seeds. As he scattered the seeds, they fell on different types of soil. Some seeds fell on the path, where birds quickly came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they sprang up quickly but withered away because they had no roots. 
Some seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But some seeds fell on good soil, where they took root, grew strong, and produced a bountiful crop, yielding thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times what was sown. This parable illustrated how different people receive the message of the kingdom of God. The seed on the path represented those who hear the message but do not understand it, and the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. The seed on rocky ground represented those who receive the message with joy but have no root and fall away when trouble or persecution comes. The seed among thorns represented those who hear the message but are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil represented those who hear the message, understand it, and produce a fruitful harvest in their lives. Through these teachings and miracles, I aim to reveal the nature of God's kingdom and invite people to experience the transformative power of faith in me. Confrontations and Final Days As my ministry grew, so did the opposition from the religious authorities. The Pharisees and other leaders felt threatened by my teachings and the miracles I performed, fearing that my growing influence would undermine their own authority. Their animosity toward me became more intense with each miracle and message I delivered. One Sabbath, I encountered a man who had been born blind. His entire life, he had lived in darkness, unable to see the beauty of the world around him. Moved with compassion, I made mud with my saliva and spread it on the man's eyes. I told him to wash in the pool of Siloam. He did as I instructed, and miraculously, he was able to see for the first time in his life. This healing caused a significant controversy because it was performed on the Sabbath, a day set aside for rest according to Jewish law. The Pharisees were outraged and summoned the man and his parents for questioning, trying to discredit the miracle. They grilled the man, hoping to find a flaw in his story or to catch him in a lie. But the man boldly testified, One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. His courage and unwavering truthfulness frustrated the Pharisees, but he remained steadfast in his testimony that I had given him sight. Another pivotal moment in my ministry was when I raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, a dear friend, had fallen seriously ill. His sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to me, hoping I would come and heal him. However, by the time I arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. The sisters were heartbroken and grieving deeply. I assured them that their brother would rise again, but they could not fully grasp what I meant. I went to the tomb, and moved by the sorrow of those around me, I wept. Then, I prayed to the Father and called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. To the astonishment of everyone present, Lazarus emerged from the tomb, still wrapped in his grave clothes. This miraculous event caused many to believe in me, but it also intensified the opposition against me. The religious leaders saw my growing influence and the belief of the people as a direct threat to their power. As the Passover approached, I entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah which spoke of a king coming to his people in humility. The crowd welcomed me with palm branches, laying them on the road before me, and shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! It was a moment of great joy and celebration, but beneath the surface, the religious leaders were plotting my arrest. During the Last Supper with my disciples, I shared a deeply significant moment with them. I took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then, I took a cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I urged them to remember me and the sacrifice I was about to make whenever they partook of these elements. Later that night, we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. I was overwhelmed with sorrow and distress, knowing the suffering that awaited me. I prayed earnestly to the Father, asking if it was possible to take the cup of suffering from me. Yet, I ultimately submitted to His will, saying, Not my will, but yours be done. This moment of deep prayer and submission was a profound example of my commitment to fulfilling the Father's plan for the salvation of humanity. Trial and Crucifixion I was arrested and taken to the high priest's house, where the religious leaders gathered to put me on trial. They questioned me and brought forward false witnesses who testified against me. Despite their efforts, they could not find any consistent evidence to convict me. The high priest finally asked me directly if I was the Messiah, the Son of God. I responded affirmatively, saying, You have said so, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. This statement enraged the high priest, who tore his clothes and accused me of blasphemy. They declared that I deserved death. I was then taken to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, early in the morning. Pilate questioned me, trying to understand the charges against me. He found no basis for a charge and saw that the accusations were driven by envy. Pilate offered to release me, as it was customary to release a prisoner during the Passover festival. He presented me alongside Barabbas, a notorious criminal, and asked the crowd whom they wanted to be released. Influenced by the chief priests and elders, the crowd shouted for Barabbas. Pilate asked them what should be done with me, and they cried out, Crucify him. Despite Pilate's attempts to reason with them, the crowd grew louder in their demands. Reluctantly, Pilate washed his hands before the crowd, declaring, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. He then handed me over to be crucified. 
The soldiers took me, flogged me brutally, and mocked me by placing a crown of thorns on my head and dressing me in a purple robe. They struck me and spat on me, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Weakened and in pain, I was led to a place called Golgotha, which means, the place of the skull. There, they nailed me to a cross between two criminals. As I hung there, enduring the excruciating pain, I looked at the people who mocked and insulted me, and I uttered, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Despite the agony, I sought forgiveness for those who were causing my suffering. As the hours passed, darkness covered the land from noon until three in the afternoon. In the midst of this darkness, I felt the weight of the world sins upon me. In my anguish, I cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This cry reflected the deep sense of abandonment I felt as I bore the sins of humanity. Finally, knowing that everything had been accomplished and to fulfill the scriptures, I said, I am thirsty. They gave me a drink of sour wine. After receiving it, I declared, It is finished, and with a loud voice, I committed my spirit into the Father's hands, saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. With that, I bowed my head and gave up my spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, symbolizing the new access to God through my sacrifice. The earth shook, rocks split, and tombs broke open. The centurion and those with him who were guarding me saw the earthquake and all that had happened, and they were terrified, exclaiming, Surely he was the Son of God. Resurrection after my death, my body was taken down from the cross and placed in a tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy follower who had requested my body from Pilate. My body was carefully wrapped in linen cloths, and a large stone was rolled in front of the entrance to secure the tomb. Roman soldiers were stationed to guard the tomb, ensuring that no one could tamper with it. On the third day after my burial, early in the morning, some devoted women, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, went to the tomb. They brought spices to anoint my body, a customary practice to honor the dead. As they approached, they wondered who would roll away the heavy stone for them. To their astonishment, they found the stone already rolled away, and the entrance to the tomb open. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. This angelic figure told them, Do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. The women were filled with awe and fear, but they quickly ran to deliver the message to my disciples. This announcement of my resurrection was the ultimate proof of my victory over sin and death. It was the fulfillment of the prophecies and the cornerstone of the faith that would spread across the world. In the days following my resurrection, I appeared to my disciples multiple times. I showed them my wounds, the nail marks in my hands and feet, and the spear wound in my side, to reassure them that it was truly I, risen from the dead. I ate with them and spoke to them, removing any doubt from their hearts and strengthening their faith. One of the most significant appearances was when I met two of my followers on the road to Emmaus. They were discussing the recent events with heavy hearts. As I joined them, they did not recognize me at first. I explained the scriptures concerning the Messiah to them, and as we shared a meal, their eyes were opened, and they recognized me. They returned to Jerusalem with joy to tell the others. Before I ascended into heaven, I gathered my disciples and gave them a great commission. I said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This command was a mandate for my followers to spread the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth. It was a mission that would continue through the ages, carried out by those who believed in me. After giving these final instructions, I led them to the vicinity of Bethany. There, I lifted my hands and blessed them. As I was blessing them, I was taken up into heaven and a cloud hid me from their sight. My disciples stood there, looking intently up into the sky, until two men dressed in white appeared beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. With this promise of my return, my disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They worshipped continually in the temple, praising God, and began to spread my teachings far and wide. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit, who I had promised would come to guide and strengthen them. Thus, the story of my resurrection and ascension marked the beginning of a new era for my followers, an era of spreading the message of hope, love, and redemption to the world. Thank you for joining me on this journey through my life. I hope you found it inspiring and enlightening. Remember, you are all part of this incredible story. If you have any questions or thoughts, please share them in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to Celestial Chronicles for more uplifting content. Until next time, may peace and grace be with you.